Um, so, one of the responses we often find when you talk to uh, New Zealand students who wish to continue their studies overseas is that you can't do world-class science or get a world-class class qualification in New Zealand. I want to know how, how you guys feel about that, whether you think it's legitimate, what you think some possible solutions are, and whether you think it's an accurate description of New Zealand science. Well, personally, I, I think that it depends on what field you're looking at. Uh, I know that like, in New Zealand there's some world class areas of study that you can undertake and be, be known around the world from coming from that particular institute but at the same time there's areas that we just don't know anything about and if you wanted to go further in that you would need to go overseas well, if you wanted to make an international name for yourself in the field yeah. I think that's right and uh, there's, there's a, lot, a lot of value in, in, in New Zealand students going to Cambridge, going to MIT, whatever, and having careers overseas, as long as at some stage they come back and become scientists or even entrepreneurs or business people in New Zealand, and, and attracting them back is a major challenge for us. You know, we've seen, seen statistics in the last few days where the people who are going overseas from New Zealand in large numbers... On average, half of them are earning over $100,000, or the equivalent of, in other countries. So they're always going to earn more money when they graduate from, uh, in some cases, much better research opportunities. They're going to have better opportunities. How do we bring them back to New Zealand? I think, crucially, the key thing that brings people back to New Zealand, whether they're scientists or business people, is their connection to New Zealand through family, through friends, through culture. And that's what brings them back. But if we can make it that much more attractive for them to come back through having a, a good economy and having a good science system that promotes talent and um, uses their, their, their skills that they've learned overseas all the better. Uh, an important point which a lot of people overlook and, and that is that if you take somebody like a, a veterinarian or, or, or a doctor who's gone through a very expensive education um, for a lot of them, the, the most pressing thing is how do they start paying off that the, their student loans? And for many of them, that will involve, at some point, going overseas, because they can earn more money there and perhaps possibly even pay less tax. Um, I think the, the thing that New Zealand needs to look at is not to stop people going overseas, but look at when they go overseas, because for a lot of uh, postgrads, they actually need to have overseas experience to, to advance in their careers. I'd, I'd have to say, though, after finishing a PhD, if you haven't lived overseas, people would find that it would be high time. They'd feel like they haven't gone away and done that, um, where a lot of their you know, uh, fellows through undergraduate courses would have maybe gone away for a year or two if they were stuck in New Zealand working or studying, then I could imagine that they'd see it as their chance to maybe go to Spain for a couple of years and do a postdoc or something. So I could see how that, that graduating process for a PhD might push someone further. And it's, it's, it's amazing these days, do you think of the length, sorry, think of how long it takes you to become an a independent researcher in science. And so, you know, science is actually getting harder. Mm. Right? You, get, you, you have to have more in-depth knowledge. Um, and, and so really these days, you know, your PhD is not sufficient to do independent research. Your first postdoc is not sufficient to do independent research. At the end of your second postdoc, you know, maybe you're, you're about right to become an independent researcher. And so when you're thinking about that, you know, that, you know you're over maybe 12 years, right, from, from high school. And part of that should be an overseas experience, right? I mean, it's just... You know, part of part of being a scientist is interacting with the international community. Part of your job is to bring ideas from overseas, so you do have to have those international connections. Okay, Kurt, so speaking on this, this similar kind of train, um, R&D tax credits are something that popped up uh, in all their glory in the most recent election. Um, I just want to know whether you guys think whether they will address New Zealand's poor R&D expenditure per capita, uh, or whether it's a more deep-seated problem, uh, the low R&D expenditure per capita, per capita because of our kind of dispersed population and low level of, levels of capital investment. Mm. I, th I, think it, I think it's a, a, a bookkeeping exercise in the sense that I saw the Australian government introduce uh, quite significant R&D rebates, if you like, on, on, on tax deductions, and 
it's essentially what happened was that uh, in a lot of Australian companies, people started designating the uh, right down to the paper clips to be a, a, a piece of R&D uh, or part of the R&D effort. Uh, everything possible that the accountants had come up with to write off as R&D got put on that side of the ledger uh, because they could get a, 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 a deduction on it. But the reality is, is that a New Zealand company is actually better off in Queensland at the moment because they can take advantage if they're a a company doing less than $20 million in turnover, they can take advantage of a 45% tax credit on every dollar they spend on R&D. So it's a competitive thing. Singapore offer this. Other countries offer this. The one thing that we've been really bad about is actually making it attractive for multinational tech and science companies to base themselves in New Zealand. And a lot of them have considered doing so. And we've narrowly missed out the likes of Pfizer and Motorola, who didn't weigh up the pros and cons of coming to New Zealand. The pros are we have a very educated economy uh, and, and workforce, we have low levels of corruption here. So there's, uh, we've got relatively good infrastructure, so there's lots of pros, but each time Singapore is offering them free leases, uh, tax breaks for the first 10 years of occupation, all these sorts of sweeteners that mean that we don't get these multinationals here. Ireland made it really attractive for uh, tech companies to go to Ireland. And uh, that sort of faltered now the economy there, but a lot of spin-off companies came out of Ireland as a result of being around Gateway and Intel and those big companies there. So we just, whether intrinsically they're, they're, they're good value or not, other countries are doing them. And as a result, these companies and some of our companies are going to other countries instead. I think we've had a big cultural problem in New Zealand and that research has been provided by the government and companies have not seen any responsibility on their part to contribute and they find it very hard to contribute and I think a lot of the um, computers behind the science reforms relied on on attracting companies to invest in research and development and it's failed. Um, so anything that can be done to encourage that would be good and I've really been really disappointed that governments have not followed this line of, of um, tech, tech exemptions for research. I think that would have been one factor which would have helped. But, we, you know, I think we've had a, we've got a long way to go to compete, can be able to say the Americans in terms of uh, private investment and research. So uh, one other question is, what are going to be the big science developments in the next kind of 12 or 18 months, I guess? So, so what, are, what are your picks? Well, look, I, yeah, I think it's going to be the discovery of the Higgs particle at CERN in Geneva. Right? The, these guys have been running for a couple of years now. They've been narrowing the window down, so that they, you know, they're trying to narrow down the, the so mass the of this particle. Yeah, I'm going to be and, the meter and, you know, the window's beginning smaller and smaller, right? So if it had been, it had been you know, quite a heavy particle, then they would have seen it. If it had been quite a light particle, they would have seen it. So there's just this narrow little window where if it's going to be found, uh, they'll find it in the next year or so. And this is, this is a particle that sort of underpins almost everything we think we know about how the universe works, right? It, it, it's, the, it's the particle that gives mass uh, to all the other particles in the standard model of particle physics. Um, and if it's not there, it's huge news. If it is there, well, it's, it's interesting news, right? And it will, will uh, you know, it'll, it'll change the course of particle physics in, in the next 10, 20 years. And the, you know, the next big, big science project will probably be to look at, you know, the fallout from the, from the Higgs particle. Speaking of big science projects, one thing that's really on New Zealand's radar, and the decision will come through in February, is whether New Zealand and Australia win the rights to host the Square Kilometre Array. And this is a multi-billion dollar project, will take the next 15 years to build, but if we win it, and my pick is, is that we will win it, we're up against South Africa bid, a Pan-African bid really, to win the Square Kilometre Array. My pick is that we'll pick it up. And that will revolutionise uh, not only astronomy in New Zealand, um, radio astronomy, but I think the science system will, will attract a lot of really high calibre people down to Australasia. So th that will happen earlier in the year. Other things, I think we'll see, uh, we're reading a lot of literature about things like photovoltaics, clean energy, alternative energy, technology is getting so much better. To the extent I think we'll see the rollout of some of that new stuff uh, in the next 18 months. Things like, for instance, we've heard a lot about that growing meat. You know, <laughs> they've, they've managed to grow little, little porcels of uh, 
uh, morsels of uh, food uh, in, 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 in vats much more efficiently than, than uh, doing it the traditional way. I think we'll see huge advances in that. Um, Amsterdam, the, the Dutch are doing a, a lot of work in that. So I think we'll probably see in the next 12 to 18 months the first hamburger that was actually grown from scratch in a vat. Yeah, I like that one about the meat. Um, I think as you grow older, then death becomes, um, you know, a, a real possibility in the future. You sort of think, now, what would I like to see before I pop, pop my clogs, as it were? And, uh, I mean, the discovery of life elsewhere would be a huge thing. And I, so I think one of the big things in the coming year will be the curiosity probe that the Americans have launched towards Mars. Uh, it's landing in August and it does have the specific purpose of looking for the possibilities that life has existed on Mars at some stage or may even exist now. So that's going to be fantastic. I, I, I don't know whether it will ever, whether it will actually solve anything next year, but it could possibly do so and it will be, it will have a terrific effect I think. Um, they made a big thing about discovery of uh, these exoplanets. And I think that's nothing compared with what, what would happen, how people would react if they actually did find evidence for life somewhere else. I, I spoke to uh, Dr Chris McKay, who's one of the NASA, the head NASA Ames researchers on that project. Yeah. He's adamant that we'll have a definitive answer of whether there's life on Mars within the next 12 months, which is uh, which it's was gonna be great. a pretty interesting thing to hear him to say. John, do you have right. any, any picks for yeah. where science is going to be in the next Peter, couple of months? Peter's pulled me in here. Uh, I'd say one thing that particularly of interest to me that I can see coming up is the ethics of uh, intelligence enhancement, particularly drugs. So I think there's becoming more of a uh, an acceptance of using stimulants and just in the general course of work or study. Um, the things like Ritalin, but now there's drugs coming to market like Modafinil uh, or Provigil which is the brand name, and I can see that now people are actually saying, I mean, they've always been there, you could take speed, you know, amphetamines way back and it'd do well in a test, but now people are looking at these pharmaceutical drugs in such a way where it's not just for people who are sick, but maybe just to make your life better, and I've seen quite a bit of discussion about the ethics of that, is it like taking drugs at the Olympics to run faster if you're in an exam, but if you're doing an exam to be a doctor and it makes you a better doctor, then maybe it's the right thing to do, because then we'll get better doctors. One thing I'm really interested in, a lot of promise for years and years in, in space and nanotechnology, we've got two nanotechnologists in front of us. Do you think in, the, in that area we're likely to see anything major in the next 18 months? Um, yeah, I, personally I do. There's, there's, there's two big things. One is related to the, uh, the, the drugs advances you were talking about, John. For me, one of them is the development of an actual treatment for ageing, so a, a chemical treatment for ageing. They've been umming and ahhing about this for a while now. I don't know whether it's going to be in the next 12 months. I doubt it. Um, I can dream. So uh, soon there will be a drug on the market for actual treatment of ageing and all its uh, combined effects. The second thing on the nanotechnology radar for me is the development of 3D organ printing. So we're finally getting our 3D printing down to a level where it's fine enough to actually detail the kind of nano and microstructure of the skeletal framework set up in organs around cells. And a lot of research has been done showing if you get the cells and you put them on these frameworks, they will actually repopulate them in terms of things like kidneys and spleens and livers and hearts um, and mice. And there will be, I mean, there's obviously going to be more research down here, but whether it will, uh, I, I hope it will expand into kind of rather than vat grown meat, vat grown <laughs> organs uh, for, for the people that need them.